This is the Winning Cures Everything Rapid Fire Recap of College Football's Week 4. Chris, everything going well over there with you? Sure. It's a uh, <laughs> Monday after a crazy weekend, so work is insane. And, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm in the same I, boat. Yeah, not as fun as I like. <laughs> I can understand that. So let, let's get through uh, what we need to get through. I've got, uh, I got 12 things that we will fly through. And, uh, and then, obviously, we'll do our reviews and uh, uh, previews and gambling picks and all that later on in the week. Uh, let's go on and jump in. Number one, Stanford and Oregon. Stanford came back from 24-7 to and absolutely stole one in Eugene. Uh, did you watch this game on uh, Saturday night? Watched almost all of it. I was back and forth between this one and the uh, Iowa-Wisconsin game. Yeah, I had both of them on at the same time. It was riveting television. Like Great. Two... Oh, it was an unbelievable game. Hey. Oregon's exciting now. Oregon's fun yes. now. It's been yes, a couple they, of years. It, they really are. It, they they looked great for fifty five minutes of this ball game. Uh, there were a few snafus that David Shaw's bunch absolutely took advantage of. The the scoop and score probably never should have been a scoop and score. I guess to make it twenty four to fourteen. I um, agree with that. And and then at the end of the ball game, like. I don't understand, one, how you can't hold on to the football there uh, with Oregon Gassed. losing the fumble. Gassed. Gassed? That, that, what, what defined that game was Stanford was ready to play the entire game, and Oregon, at the end of the fourth quarter, their defense completely gassed, had no yep. energy, could not stop Stanford at all. And Oregon's running game, I think their offensive linemen were done. I think the running back was struggling. He had had a lot of miles on that game, a lot of energy, a lot of adrenaline, and you're towards the end of this game. You see the finish line, and I just think they fell a little short. Yeah, but they, they do look like they've got the players. They've got uh, the pieces to, to at least make an interest. Everybody crystal ball for that, and I don't know that that's coaching Safu's. Man, I heard a couple people saying he could have taken three knees and punt it, and they probably would have been fine and won the game. Not a single coach in the country is going to coach it that way. No, not a chance. I don't think that's on Cristobal. I, I was excited for Oregon football after that game. I agree. I agree. Now, Stanford Stanford is now ranked number seven in the country. Are they the seventh best team in the country? No, no. But they're going to probably stay up there the entire year until they play Washington because I don't know that the Pac-12 is any good. I, I think I might agree with you there. I, this game this weekend against Notre Dame will, will tell us a lot because I think Notre Dame figured it out. Uh, but we'll talk about that here later on in this one. Number two, Iowa absolutely gave away the game to Wisconsin. Uh, their defense Turnovers. held up. Yeah, yeah, their defense held up, and, and the offense gave the game away. Uh, what, the story what were your to takes all on these that? games is turnovers. Story to all of them yeah. turnovers. Yeah, it really is. Uh, Iowa's offense – you know, it, obviously they're not going to stretch the field a whole lot. Uh, their tight ends did relatively well. The running backs looked good, uh, although you're not going to look great against Wisconsin. Iowa's defense held Wisconsin in check for most of the game, and at the end of the ball game, le like deep in the fourth quarter, and I know it was a 28-17 score. If you haven't watched the game, uh, that last touchdown was an end around by a 250-pound guy that yeah. Iowa just they had to sell out. And right. Wisconsin knew exactly how to uh, how to attack that. So yeah, I mean, I think both teams look good. Iowa still looks like an eight nine win team to me. Uh, Wisconsin, you know, I think they probably wrapped up the uh, the Big Ten West, but it, just because of how awful everybody else in that side of the division have looked. But uh, I, I'm still not super impressed with Wisconsin. They don't look like a national title contender to me, and well, and I thought they would have been. No. But but there's there's only like three teams in the country that look like national title contenders. I mean, that, That's, so I don't I don't know that you knock Wisconsin because they're not one of those three teams. Yeah, maybe four. But well, we're we're gonna get to that because I've got a couple of questions for you about some of these conferences and some of these teams. Okay, okay. Uh, let's move on. Number three, Kentucky, huge win, twenty eight to seven over Mississippi State. Uh, that was uh, look I. I texted you beforehand and said, yo, I'm taking Kentucky straight up in a parlay. Uh, 
I've, I felt good about Kentucky being able to keep the game close. I didn't know that they were actually going to win. It was surprising to me how dominant they were. They gave up 56 yards rushing to a Mississippi they State team. That, yeah, they've been averaging over 300 yards rushing a game. Now, granted, it was against crap competition, but 300 yards a game rushing, and they only gave up 56. This was in a, a brutal rainstorm, and Kentucky is good on, on both, both sides of the line. Like, they're Marshall, really, really good. Dukes has got the thing turned around. It took him a little longer than we all thought it might. But uh, but they're they're playing really well. Are they the second best team in the West in the East? Well, I, I think that's what this weekend is going to determine. So at one of our just a little preview. One of our top five games for this coming weekend is Kentucky and South Carolina, which that may not look like a huge game nationally um, because it's not a ranked matchup. Yeah, it's the it's the it's for number two in the SEC East, which. For the foreseeable future, it will be Georgia at number one in the East. But with Florida and Tennessee both kind of out of it, it looks like Kentucky and South Carolina have a chance to uh, to really make noise. And, I mean, Kentucky just blew the doors off of Mississippi State. Part of me wonders if State was, was caught looking ahead a little bit, um, which is tough to look ahead against an undefeated team. But, I mean, you've got Dan Mullen coming back into Starkville this week. I just wonder if, if they didn't go all in on this game. If they didn't, shame on them. Kentucky looks good. I was about good, to say, my, my question is this. Is this Moorhead? Because, you know. It's something I brought up to you early in the year, right? I mean, I, we don't know exactly what he's going to be. Everybody's crowning Mississippi State uh, to be this 9-10 win team this year. Dark Horse SEC West uh, title contender. And – I mean, it, you're talking. You're no taking offense. an offensive coordinator. You're taking an offensive coordinator away from a team where the head coach pretty much ran most of the offense anyway. Yeah. How great is he? That's that's the question. And what, one of the things I brought up to uh, somebody that commented on our YouTube before was uh, they said, you know, Mississippi State's going to win the West. That's right. And I said, eh, I, I need to see Nick Fitzgerald be able to throw the football first, and he still hasn't shown me that. So, if you can stop the run on Mississippi State, you're going to win the ball game because they can't score. Uh, number four is Texas back, thirty-one to sixteen over TCU. Now, it, it's all about perception, right? So, like with Kentucky and Mississippi State, it's like, well, is Kentucky really good, or was Mississippi State just not very good? Well, with Texas and TCU, it's like, eh, is Texas actually pretty good, or is TCU not that good? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I like the. Texas has had a lot of turnover luck, and sometimes those balls bounce a different way. They did look pretty good uh, in the trenches, which is, I mean, that's where you start to uh, to build a program. Uh, I think there's positive vibes at Texas. It, a big portion of all of this is confidence, right? If Texas feels like they can win big ball games, they've got the talent to be able to do it. So for a long time, they didn't have any confidence. And that's how you lose games to, like, Kansas and whatever. Situation like this, you know, they go to Kansas State this weekend. Kansas State doesn't look very good. We'll see how they look this weekend against a not very good opponent. Uh, if they can blow them out of the water, yeah, you know, we, we might might seem to think something different. Right now, I'm still just kind of iffy, wondering if eh, maybe if the ball bounced a different way, they would have lost, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not buying Texas yet. Uh, I'll tell you things that I think are a little bit better. Uh, we are both fans of Pat Forty, Dan Wetzel, and those guys. Yes. Um, and they talk about um, the Texas home crowd now is way better than it was. Back in the day, they had a like a pretty wine and cheese kind of crowd where people came as a social <laughs> event is the way they worded it. And, yeah. And now it's a home field advantage. It's it, Tom Herman has gotten – the city, the area, the school to buy into. You guys got to come out, and you got to get crazy for us. You got to give us that extra man in the stands um, that they haven't had, and they hadn't had it for a while. Uh, they had it. They had it Friday, uh, Saturday, and they had it the Saturday before against USC. Yeah. So I think when they play at home, that is a big advantage. I need to see them go on the road because the last time we saw them go on the road and play a Power Five conference team, it was getting blown out by Maryland. Yes, that is uh, that is true. So we will see what moves on from there. Number five, Virginia Tech loses at Old Dominion. 
what in the hell happened here? And, like, this was not just them losing Josh Jackson. This no, was no. – they gave up, like, almost 700 yards of offense to Old Dominion with a backup quarterback. Like, that, they – I just – I don't know. I can't explain that. Justin now, okay, Fuente hey. came out and, and said afterwards that, okay, y'all all played real hard and, blew, and looked good when people were doubting you. And now whenever you have everybody talking good about you, this is how you're going to show up. So which one is it? What are you going to be? Well, let me let me tell you this. So and, and and I've said this a couple of times. I don't know if I've said it on the podcast much. I've talked to a lot of different people about it. Um, I am a follower of Mike Lombardi's. I have read his book, The Gridiron Genius. I listen to his podcast. I read the the things that he writes when he writes for either The Ringer or um, a couple other uh, places that he's written on, and. Um, he, he has a couple of things where he tells stories about when he was with the Raiders and Al Davis was intricately involved in player personnel, okay? He says, we're going to get to this when we get to the NFL recap because this happened a lot over the weekend. But um, him and some of the other personnel guys would always kind of talk amongst themselves in the locker rooms and behind the scenes saying, we're one big injury away from being a really good team. I know this was a backup quarterback, but the backup quarterback for Old Dominion is way better and should be the starter. He's he's yeah. just a better football player. They were one big injury away from being a good team, and maybe Old Dominion's a better team, but it doesn't matter. They're not on the same playing field. The rest of the 22 guys starting, 21 guys starting, have no business being there, and and Vitek should have taken care of business. It, it just makes no sense, but uh, – but but I'm not going to say, oh, they did it with a backup quarterback, so it's even worse. His backup quarterback is way better than the starter was. He just is. I agree. Uh, the name is Blake LaRusso for anybody that wants to look that's, him up. That's He's, right. That's the kid's name. I couldn't yeah. remember his name, and I was I was about to start looking it up on my phone, and I figured, nah, let me just go with it. Uh, no, no, no. It's all good. Blake LaRusso, the Old Dominion's backup. He threw for 495 yards, five touchdowns. They ran were, it up on him. At the end yeah. of the game, could have kneeled the, kneeled the ball, ran it up, and was sticking it in again. <laughs> It ran for like a forty-something yard touchdown. It's, it was awesome. I mean, you you got to show a little pride, Virginia Tech. Give me give me something here. Uh, number six. What the hell happened to Oklahoma State? Forty-one to seventeen loss at home to Texas Tech. You and I both had this as one of our favorite bets of the week. Both uh, my it, guys, both of my quarter uh, coaches that I love to bet on, just let me down. Well, I I was super surprised, and I, I saw a stat. Uh, Felica actually told me this. Um, he said, like, Oklahoma State, after a, uh, after a ranked win uh, and covering the spread, they're like 1-6 against the spread under Gundy, yeah. like in that situation. Like, I didn't know that. It, but I, I still didn't think that it would matter because, like, Texas Tech opening the gear has not looked good. Like, they looked good against Houston last week. Uh, but obviously their defense still gave up 49 points against Houston. Let's say. They, they shut down Oklahoma State completely. Oklahoma State's offense could not move the ball. I, com- I fully expected Oklahoma State to, to run uh, Justice Hill. And I, I he, felt like they punted more touches. in that game. Yeah, I feel like they punted more in that game than they've punted all year. Uh, probably in Maybe in all year several combined. years. <laughs> like, yeah. I, mean, no, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was nuts. Alan Bowman, the freshman for Texas Tech, he was uh, 35 out of 46, 397 yards, two touchdowns, two picks. This kid is for real. Like, this is what it felt like when Baker Mayfield took that job at Texas Tech. It's like this kid comes out of nowhere. It's just yeah. what is happening here. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make of Oklahoma State anymore. Uh, and I'm not sure what Texas Tech is, but they got a big one coming up against West Virginia this weekend. Uh, number seven, Army takes Oklahoma to overtime. 28-21 loss uh, for Army. Oklahoma, look, I I don't know what to make of this because like it's such it's an offense that they're not going to see again for the rest of the year. Uh, Army ran for 339 yards and took 44 minutes and 40 some odd seconds off the clock. Oklahoma only had the ball 15 minutes during the game, and I mean they they scored basically every time they had the ball, which was not much. <laughs> Uh, I mean, but that's you, how you that's how you beat yeah. these high powered offenses. That's how you stay in these games. Is you just keep their offenses on the sidelines. You keep yeah. them over there. You keep Lincoln Riley. You know, just yeah. If you don't get the ball, you can't defense. score. That's right. What What do you make of this? Is Is Oklahoma not as good as we thought? 
I mean, is that an overreaction? Is I, I is, think when they play teams that can run the ball and control the clock, just because they don't run the option, I still think the power run teams would give them problems. I think if they made the playoffs against an Alabama or a Georgia, I don't think that they're in the same ball game because those teams can run the football. And, and obviously, it's not just an option offense. It's running the football is all the option offense is. And yeah. If you can't stop the run, you're not going to beat those big boy teams because those defenses are going to make you punt at least a that's, couple games. That's true. That's true. Uh, let's see. That was uh, Army number eight, Florida 47, Tennessee 21. This game, this game tells a different story if you look at a box score and not watch the game. I'm, I'm going to get to another box score to end the, uh, the recap here in a little bit. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, Tennessee had six turnovers. Uh, Florida, let's see, I've actually got it pulled up here. Uh, Florida actually had da, 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 total yards only 387 to Tennessee's 364. 364. This was yeah. an even game. Tennessee was better on third down than them. Tennessee yeah. passed for more yards than them. Uh, rushing was not a whole lot different. Total yardage was really, really close. It and they couldn't hold on to the football. The turnovers. Yeah. I mean, it's – I, I can't look at this and say that Florida is like, oh, Dan Mullen's turning a corner and whatnot. Like, I will say this. They were efficient when they got the turnovers, right? They they converted when they had to. They uh, beat a bad team. And the thing about yeah. Tennessee is because they've been burned by so many coaches and so many people getting their hopes up and then let down and getting their hopes up and let down, as soon as it went south in that game, 100,000-seat stadium went silent. And and all the oh, everybody was gone. By halftime, everybody's out of there, and yeah. it's just over. It's the, you've you've lost it. These people are not going to stick around and continue to support this program until they can give them something to get excited about. I don't know that I blame them. I don't know that I beat Tennessee fans up for that. No, I, I don't blame them at all. I don't blame them at all. What do you make of uh, all right? So, uh, uh, Sap, the uh, the linebacker, left Tennessee at halftime. And then at, at the end of the game, Pruitt comes out and says, well, he didn't just leave like I asked him to leave. He wouldn't come we in the game, but we told him to go in. And well, and then, and then the kid comes out on Twitter like last night and says, uh, this was a miscommunication. I was never asked to come in the game. This was a sideline altercation. Yep. I'm sure it's going to be handled internally, but like, I don't want my reputation sold yeah. from this. I was not asked to go in the game. Like, what, what are you making this? I, I am more inclined to believe these players. I really am. Just because, A, I think if the player is the one lying, I think it's really easy for the administration to point out that the player was lying because they're the ones that control all the extra sideline film and footage and, and control the message coming out of everybody else. The player yeah. does, the coaches control that. The players don't. I think if a player is ever going to lie on a coach like this, then, then it'll get called out in a second. It'll get proven wrong in a second. That's, it, and this goes to, you know, not to bring it up again, I, I believe Jalen Hurts over Nick Saban when that thing happened. I just think these coaches feel like their instinct is to tell the best story they can tell and assume these players are never going to stand up or speak up for themselves. And we just don't live in that day anymore. You're not going to be able to tell something about a player today. They've got courage. They've got protection in the world that we live in, where we just don't like bullies. And, yeah. And, and Pruitt, Pruitt's kind of a bully coach. If he can win, everybody forgives it and moves on. But you can't come out here and lie on a player like that. You just can't. And today – Yeah, I didn't understand I'm why so, he even talked about it. Like, it, yeah. why, why even bring it up? Like, if yeah. somebody actually asked the question, which is fine sure. – but all he's got to say is, we're going to handle this internally, handle no comment. internally, and that's none of your business. Don't worry about it. That's none of your business. I respect the player for, A, if there was an altercation, he didn't throw the other player or coach under the bus. He didn't say anybody else's name who got an altercation with. He just yeah. said, there was an altercation, and I was asked to leave. Yeah. I mean, that's it's it. simple enough. Uh, let's yeah. move on. Uh, number nine, nine. Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Over Wake Forest, not much to talk about here other than the fact that they've been starting the wrong quarterback all year. Ian Book, uh, he accounts for five touchdowns. Uh, it's 
I mean, it was an absolute beatdown. Uh, did you watch any of this game at all? Oh, yeah. Like I said, once again, it's going to come back. It happened a lot this weekend. So many of these teams are an injury away from being a really good team. Yeah. And because he was 25. He was 25 out of 34, 325 yards, and two touchdowns. Like he was this, something yeah, else. Going to sound like a mockingbird, but that's the theme of the weekend across the board. It really is. What's it? So many coaches are so loyal to people that stick around the program and all that. Um, I, so this is where I disagree. I don't think it's a loyalty thing. I don't think it's a loyalty thing at all. I, I think these coaches are trying – they're only doing what's best for them. That's that's all they're doing. And I don't knock them for that. But at the same time, at some point you've got to figure out, A, I don't know that they know the answer. I don't think that they know how to evaluate their own players – especially when you have two different styles. And then yeah. I think they're more opt to stick with the style they've been playing with than to change. I think that was a big thing with Alabama and Tua. Everybody yeah. knew Tua was better than Jalen. But the problem is, is we got to change our whole offense. And coaches are so afraid to change what they've been doing. They get in these mold that it's worked for so long, I don't want to stop. Yeah, I don't want to do something that, that could end up being a huge risk. That's right. right? And, and I think I think we're learning, man, if I was a coach, as soon as I know that I've got a losing hand in a guy and i got a winning hand in another guy, I fold it. I fold it, I pick up the other hand, and I go. I just yeah. go. But if i got to make a lot of changes, that's my job. That's why these guys get paid five, six million dollars a year. I'm sorry, your job's hard. <laughs> who, would have ever, who would have ever thought we'd pay you millions of dollars to do a job that's difficult? Exactly. Uh, with Ian Book in, Notre Dame looks like a legit top 10 team. Uh, yep. they, they, with the way the schedule is setting up, I mean, they – look, they host Stanford this week. They play at Virginia Tech next week. Those don't look as difficult as they did at the beginning of the season. No. I mean, you win those two games, like the trip to Florida State doesn't look bad. If their I mean, run defense can hold love, which – Pretty much everybody that's everybody else to holding love <laughs> has held. They were like, look, you're not going to win the Heisman. That's just it. We're going to yeah, make Stan- sure you, we might not is win averaging, games, but you're yeah. not winning the Heisman. Stanford is only averaging like 104 yards rushing per game. Yeah. Like, it's insane to me. Now, that doesn't mean that K.J. Costello can't come back and win a game like he did in, in the Oregon game. That's right. Uh, but, man, I mean, it's, it's nuts to think about. Uh, number 10, real quick, Michigan demolished. Uh, Nebraska, fifty-six to ten. Uh, first time Nebraska has started zero and three since I believe before World War II. Uh, this was ugly in every way, shape, or form. Look, man, they might it's, be zero and four if it wasn't for Akron. Oh yeah, back out of that game. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Uh, the Nebraska situation. One, did you see Wendy's tweet afterwards? Like the fast food. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so it, it might need a Scott Frosty to, to help yes. get over this beating. Um, that was cool. And then the other side was, does it uh, like does it ever amaze you the things that motivate football teams? Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but the Michigan players and coaches were all talking about Scott Frost's comments after UCF played at Michigan like two years ago, like his first year at UCF. When he came out after the game, Michigan beat him by like four touchdowns. But Scott Frost came out afterwards and said, uh, "We out hit Michigan today. Like we might have lost on the scoreboard, but we out hit them." And Harbaugh has held on to that for three years before he could play him again. <laughs> and well, I mean, just took what, him to the that's, woodshed. That's what coaches do. I, you know, I don't. I don't I'm. I will never be all-time greatness like these guys are because I don't. I don't just don't have that gene where I can hang on to something that long. That's ridiculous. Yes, yeah. but that's, I agree. That's that's kind of what makes these coaches a little special. Definitely quirky and unique. Um, but and ridiculously competitive, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They're way more competitive than I'll ever be. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. In that game, uh, Nebraska had 132 yards of total offense. It was uh, Michigan's it was defense is good. I mean, when they want to clamp somebody down, they can. Oh, they absolutely can. Number eleven, so that we can wrap up this one and one more. Uh, Purdue, zero and three before, but they had lost to three games by a combined uh, eight points. Jeff they Brom. beat Boston College. Yeah, Jeff Brom, thirty to thirteen over Boston team. College. That Boston College team's really good. 
but they are incredibly up and down. And they were last year too, where it's they could they're world beaters one week, and the next week they can lose to like Eastern Michigan, right? So it's, when you run a high powered, up tempo, fast paced offense, and they're not spread offense, they're running that high power from a pro style offense. Yes. Yeah, you you punt a lot, and that puts your defense out there a lot, which gets games out of hand. The problem is, is once you're built to play that way, you you can't change. You can't stop. Yeah, you can't change what you're doing. You gotta, you gotta take that butt whipping. And that's uh, what was crazy. Like this game, I think it might have been a little closer, but uh, the quarterback Brown threw four interceptions, and that was all she wrote. There was nothing to, right. to go from that, there. That guy, that uh, guy's got to do something to get his confidence back because he's gone mentally. Yeah, he's he. He really is, and it, it all left in this game. I mean, that's yep. nuts to see it all go down in one game, but we'll see what he does uh, this coming Jeff week. Jeff Braun uh, coming home, man. I love seeing yeah, it. I, I agree with you. So they're, they're ready to get into Big Ten play again uh, after the close loss to Northwestern. I, I'll be curious to see what they do against a, a very weak-looking Big Ten West. Uh, number 12, final one. I doubt anybody watched this game. I'm just curious if you saw the box score. It said Auburn 34, Arkansas 3. Did you see the box score on this? I flipped over to this a couple of times because well, on I didn't Twitter, watch the second of the game, but I, on, but I, I mean, I looked through all the scores. So on Twitter, I, I see it in real time as Auburn fans and whatnot are losing their minds about this is the worst offensive line play. And you turn over to the game, and they're up by like three touchdowns, right? So you're going, what the hell are they talking about? Until you watch for a little bit and you realize, like, wow, Arkansas is a bad football team, and they are out gaining Auburn. They are, I mean, everything about this, the the final, let's see, total yards, Arkansas had 290. They held Auburn at Auburn to 225 yards total. They had 134 passing, only 91 rushing yards on 36 attempts against Arkansas. They had two kick returns for touchdowns. Uh, Arkansas turned the ball over twice. Like, for this score to be this lopsided and the box score to say something completely different, I didn't know what to make of this. It is Auburn, like, did LSU beat something out of them? And maybe we just missed it. I don't know. I, I think there's a part of me that feels like they got a lead. Just don't blow the lead. They're just trying to win a game. They're not trying to get style points. They're not trying to do that stuff. They're just trying to make sure they don't blow a lead. And at no point in time were they close to giving up the points. Um, every time Arkansas would go on a drive that was dangerous, they would either miss a field goal or turn the ball over. It just didn't work out. Um, Arkansas yeah. got down so much that they had to keep going for it. They couldn't score. And and I think if you're okay with that, you're just okay with the way the game turns out. You're trying to get away with Ws. They coughed up wins to LSU two years back to back. Um, maybe getting a little cute and or trying to ice games away. I think I think this was one of those where Malzahn might be the only coach in the country if he was Oregon's coach after what he's been through the last couple of years saying, I think I'll kneel it three times and punt and hope that you can't <laughs> score in 17 seconds. Like, like that's the truth. It's, I think he was just trying to get out with a win. I can understand that. I can and I also that. think that Arkansas is going to – this has got to be their kitchen sink game, right? Like, this has got to be a game where they say, look, man, we're losing to everybody. We're a laughing stock on national TV to everybody, we got to throw everything we have at a game and try to win it. And they didn't come close. They didn't yeah, come they close. Didn't, didn't come close at all, at all. All right, as always, the show is brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. Uh, go check out all the sports books. Go check out everything to do at tunicatravel.com. And you can go check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. All of our picks, our recaps, all of that is up there, our – Football contest will be up on Tuesday once all the lines are set and confirmed. Um, yeah, we will uh, We will be back. Hey, let me ask you a question. Yeah, go ahead. The ACC, pretty down. Uh, Clemson, it, analytically, Clemson goes it is the worst. Clemson yeah, goes it, undefeated. They got one good win, a road win at A&M. Do they deserve one of those four seats? I mean, it depends on how they look against that ACC. Yeah, I disagree. Like if, 
I just disagree with that. If the ACC is down just because you beat the hell out of somebody who sucks, doesn't mean you get more credit for beating somebody who sucks. I just don't. They almost lost and probably should have lost if not for a really bad rule. Every, all the rules were followed perfectly. To Texas A&M. But to Texas A&M, they lose that game. They play one good game and they almost lost it. Then they get to beat the hell out of a bunch of kids. And now we're going to put it, them in the playoff. We'll see. We'll see what happens with the uh, with the rest of the ACC. Like I, I, we're four weeks into the season. I'm not ready to write everybody off yet. Uh, yeah. But yeah. yeah, I mean they they don't look good right now. Uh, but I, I still think it depends. The second best team in the ACC, and they beat up on Syracuse this week at home. That doesn't tell me anything. Yeah, the the only other undefeated ACC teams right now: Syracuse, NC State, and Duke. And Duke's uh, starting quarterbacks out with a broken collarbone. That's right. So. Anyway, just just a thought, just a thought. I'm gonna crap on the ACC for a minute. Hey, it's all good. I understand that. So, like like I said, we will be back later this week with our previews, uh, NFL recap coming tomorrow, all the wonderful things. Uh, check out WinningCuresEverything.com. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. We'll see you guys next go round. Thanks, Chris. See you.